Hi, I'm Art Bergeron, and the presentation you're about to see is the one that I would have done uh, in Northboro and in surrounding communities this month, except for COVID-19. Uh, with me is my friend Liz Tridiak, who's going to be talking a little bit about big news at the Senior Center. The presentation for this month is all about, especially if you're single, planning to deal with where things go to the kids or the grandkids. If one of the kids has got a problem, do you want to put it into trust? If you've got a cottage, how do you deal with that? What's the estate tax issue? It's a bunch of stuff. I hope you enjoy the presentation. And in the meantime, I hope you go to the Senior Center. Liz, what is new at the Northboro Senior Center this in June? I am so excited to finally announce that June 1st, our doors will be unlocked and the community is welcome back in. Um, this came kind of fast and furious at us after 15 months of being closed, but here we are ready to um, throw the doors back open. So as of June 1st, the community can come back in. Masks will not be required, but are encouraged. If you want to wear a mask, please feel free to do so. Um, our larger programs have not returned back inside the building just yet, but our smaller programs of about 10 to 12 people are, or less are returning. So we thank everyone in advance for their patience with us as we bring back all their favorite activities. Other big news, our bistro is open Monday through Thursday, 12 to 1. So please stop up and have lunch with us. It's a great opportunity to catch up with your friends after this long, long year that just passed us by. And then other than that, Arthur, we have some really fun new programs. We have Birds in Your Backyard lecture coming up. We have Broadway on the Brickway with pianist uh, George Curtis. We have a new um, nature journaling course coming up called Earth Notes. And um, we're doing a time capsule for folks to share their feelings of what it was like to live through the COVID pandemic for the past year. and capture your experience here at the Senior Center with um, all your peers. And that's so, so there's a lot of great stuff. This, and, and you know, this, the time capsule thing, this is a great idea that these folks have come up with for a lot of us to kind of help memorialize what we've just gone through and help other people understand how difficult this time has been. You know, remember Absolutely. originally the switch got shut off very abruptly a long time ago and suddenly the switch is back on. So like, congratulate yourself, you know, we've survived this. Things are, weird. Things are coming back slowly. Don't be embarrassed about wearing a mask. We all appreciate the fact everybody's, you know, we're respectful of each other. It, but, but, you know, go see Liz Tridia. She's been dying to see you, real people, like forever. <laughs> so Liz, if they wanna, if folks wanna reach you regarding any of these programs, what's your best number? 508-393-5035. And if you got any questions on the seminar, give me a call. Um, my direct line is 508-860-1470. Hope you enjoy the presentation. Hope you get to see Liz Tridiak. Have a great June. Have a great June. Thank you. Hi, uh, I'm Art Bergeron. I'm an elder law attorney at Myrick O'Connell. Uh, if you haven't seen one of these presentations before, this is, these are monthly seminars regarding a number of elder law issues. And this one is about really dealing with the kids or the grandkids, which is, or you can't take it with you, but you can control who gets it. Um, I, as you've often, if you've seen these presentations, you know that I'm often talking about my friends Frank and Mary and their kids, Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr. Uh, and, their, and their goal is very simple. You know, they want to live in their house until they die. They want to be buried in the backyard. And in, in this particular case, Frank has already been buried in the backyard in, in, because in the standard estate plan for Frank and Mary, unless it's an unusual case, a blended marriage, something else, um, their basic estate plan is if one of them dies, everything goes to the other. And so in this case, and, and typically their assets are held jointly by the two of them, so that if one of them dies, everything does just go to the other. Uh, there are no, there's no probate, there's nothing like that. So the question then is, though, what if Frank has died and now Mary is trying to figure out her estate plan? Remember now, this is not a, plan, a, a program about, for example, protecting Mary's assets in the event that she needs nursing home care. We've, we, that's a whole set of separate issues which we cover in a separate program. Um, this is about what happens with Mary's assets when she dies to the extent that she's got particular desires about how all of that works. So in this case, Mary owns a house worth about $400,000. 
She and Frank owned a cottage, which is now just hers. Can be on probably on the Cape or on, on the in Maine someplace, and it's worth about four hundred thousand dollars. <throat> Obviously, at this point, that's a very small cottage if it's on the Cape. Um, they, she has an IRA. Uh, he, Frank had had an IRA, which she turned into her own IRA, uh, worth three hundred thousand, and they have savings of about two hundred thousand dollars. Now, <clears throat> if Mary were to, and so their total assets were about one point three million dollars. If Mary were to die tomorrow then all of these assets except the IRA would need to go through the probate process before they could be distributed. The IRA, as long as she's been paying attention and has made sure that she named um, somebody as a death beneficiary, probably the kids, would pass immediately to those kids at the time of her death. Um, so the, que this, the question then is, if Mary died in that situation, what happen would happen if she died without a will? Um, inevitably, when I bring this up, people will say, well, I don't want the, anything to go to the state. Trust me, nothing will go to the state. Nothing will go to the state. As kind of my rule of thumb is, has always been, if there's money, there are, there are relatives that will find it. If there was no Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr., some second cousin, once removed from someplace, will show up to get the money. So the question is, if there, therefore, if there is no will, where does that money go? Well, the answer is, um, in, Frank, in, in Mary's case, uh, since she has children, it would simply go to the children, and they would divide those assets equally. If any of the three children had been predeceased, had predeceased her, um, then the, the children of that child will divide that child's share. If that child has no children, then that child's share will go to the remaining siblings. Uh, if any of those grandchildren are under age 18, um, then that money will be held by them or by their guardian, which we, who would get appointed by the court until they're 18, at which point they'd get a very big check for all of that money. If there were no children, children in this case and Mary had any siblings, then the money would go to her siblings. Frank's siblings would not be involved. If any of her siblings had died, which is often the case in these cases, uh, then that, then, then the, the, the share that would have gone to the siblings uh, may end up going to the children of the siblings. We won't go through all of that today. Um, the point, though, is that there is a system, and in the case where Mary, where Mary dies, leaving Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr., there's a clear path to what is going to happen. So the question from Mary's perspective, or Mary's initial question as an estate planning perspective, is, is that how she wants things to come out? And if she does, if that system is okay, then actually um, Mary really doesn't need a will. So the, the question then is, are there any reasons why Mary might want to have a will? Um, for example, if Mary wants to have all assets divided equally among the three children, the question is, does any of those children have any issues? For example, um, Dealing with the daughter-in-law you don't like anyway. Is, does Frank uh, or does Peter, the oldest son, uh, have a wife uh, but there are some marital problems so that you're concerned that maybe if you died and left a lot of, of money to Peter, that money might get included in the divorce settlement if Peter and his wife end up getting divorced. Um, this happens. This happens. And certainly a lot of parents are worried about this happening, even if relations are now fine between spouses, because you know, you, you never know. So if that is an issue, <clears throat> you should be aware of a couple of things. First of all, um, when the court is deciding how to divide up assets, the rule in Massachusetts, and this is not the same as the rule in other states, is that that division needs to be equitable but not equal. So the court is really going to take into account regarding each of the, the uh, spouses in this situation where the spouse is going to end up as a result of this divorce. It's so that if one of the, the spouses is going to end up because of other possible resources very well off, then the court's going to take that into consideration and probably reduce the share of the assets that would be going to that spouse. If on the other hand, one of the spouses has no, you, it is clear, has no other assets, then the judge is going to take that into account. So a question that often comes up, folks will talk to me about, well, 
what, how do I deal with this? Can I simply put the money that would have gone to this son, in this case, into trust uh, for that son? And the question is, what are the rules of the trust? By simply putting the money into trust, you're not necessarily protecting that money. Um, and the, the reason for that is um, there is this, this standard that the court will look at regarding trust, and that is accessibility. Sure, the money is in trust, that divorce judge would say, but can, the, 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 can Peter, in this case, easily get access to those funds? If he can, to the extent that he can, the court is going to, and this is totally in the judgment of the court, there are no hard and fast rules here. If he can, then the court is going to take that into account in figuring out how these assets ought to get divided. So if you're the parent and you're trying to figure out how to deal with this, one question is, is it appropriate to have a sibling as a trustee? Well, if the sibling is the trustee, and there are no limits on the distributions that can be made to Peter, the court may very well assume that the trustee is simply going to give the money to Peter as soon as this divorce is over, and therefore that as far as the court is concerned, those assets should be included in figuring out the ultimate distribution of the marital assets. <clears throat> if, on the other hand, there's a professional trustee um, uh, handling the money, whether it's a bank or, or, or whether it's a, 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 an unrelated individual, um, and if there are constraints on the distributions to the trustee, perhaps constraints on a maximum distribution or a maximum distribution per year, then that may, may um, affect the judge's decision in terms of saying, well, you know, the, this, Peter really doesn't have the, this control of these assets, so we shouldn't be dividing the assets this way. Finally, if there are grandchildren, one option may be to be simply leaving the assets in trust for the benefit of the grandchildren so that they wouldn't be part of the marital estate of Peter. So these are all possibilities, and only you know what the family situation is, um, but, th there are way but th the main the takeaway here is that it isn't simply a matter of putting assets uh, in the name of one of the other children as a trustee. <clears throat> Second, well, now we're going to talk about Paul a little bit. Suppose Paul has a disability. Well, in that case, simply leaving things to Paul may affect the government benefits to which he is otherwise entitled. Uh, in the case of Social Security Disability Benefits, or SSDI, there would not be an effect since SSDI, it which is really meant as, as the kind of the substitute uh, for folks who end up with a disability before they retire. And so, and, so, and so instead of getting their Social Security only when they retire, they become entitled to Social Security payments during, as soon as they can show that they are totally and permanently disabled. Once that's happened, though, the, 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 Paul would be entitled to those checks regardless of whether uh, Paul received an inheritance from you. So that's not an issue. And if, Paul, if you left money in trust and left an income stream to, to Paul also, there would be no issue since there is no limit on his ability to get other income. There is a limit on his ability to earn income himself by working, That's because that's the whole concept behind SSDI, is that you can't work. Um, but there would be no limit regarding any income that he could receive or any assets that he would have. On the other hand, regarding MassHealth, the Massachusetts name for the Medicaid program, um, there are asset limits. And if, P, if P, Paul had inherited a lot of money, he probably would end up getting excluded from this program. On the other hand, if money were put into trust for Paul's benefit um, and, and he were receiving income from, from, some, from that trust, that would not be a problem because there are no uh, asset limits. There, while there are asset limits regarding what Paul can have in his own name, money put in trust for him by a third party would not be counted on that asset limit. And if there were distributions being made to him, that income to him would not, be, would not affect in any way his ability to get mass health. Finally, there's supplemental security income, or SSI, which is often confused with SSDI. To get SSI, you just have to show that you're poor. And poor means really poor. If you're an individual, in, in Paul's case, um, that, that poor means probably less than $600 a month. And the goal of SSI is to provide a government supplement 
to get Paul up to that income amount, that monthly income amount. Therefore, to the extent that he has other assets from which he could draw, that's going to affect his qualification. To the extent that these other assets are in trust, but the trustee um, has the ability to make payments to him, that's also going to affect his qualification because it's going to be factored into his total income in terms of determining whether he needs this supplement, the supplement to the, so to the security income. That is why um, in many cases, um, while it, it, in, in cases when you're dealing with either these mass health issues or with SSI as opposed to SSDI, you can always create a trust, name one of the other siblings as the trustee, um, it, and, and, and accept that if the issue is making sure that Paul can qualify for SSI, you may want to limit the discretion of the trustee to actually hand Paul money. That's why the typical supplemental needs trust will specify that the trustee, typically one of the other children, has the ability to use the money on Paul's behalf to pay for a number of things, um, but does not have the ability to simply give it to him. Um, by the way, there is a, a, a myth that if any of the money can be used for Paul's housing, that that eliminates his SSI payment. That is incorrect. It simply reduces it by a fairly small percentage. Finally, though, when you're dealing with these kinds of uh, trust issues, you want to deal with where the final distribution is going to go after Paul dies. That's uh, especially important uh, if Paul has no children. You may be specifying that Paul, after Paul's death, the money will simply get divided among the kids. It has been my experience that in many of these cases, though, there are no surviving children. So you want to be dealing with what happens after Paul dies, because at that point, Peter and Mary, Mary Jr., the other two siblings may be pretty old, so you may be dealing with where that, where that money is going to go. Um, so finally, there's Mary. Mary doesn't have a disability. Mary doesn't have a spouse to, uh, to worry about. But Mary may have other issues. Mary may have creditor problems. May, Mary may have problems with the IRS. Um, Mary may, uh, so, so the effect of really leaving a lot of money to Mary would really be that you're leaving money to those creditors or to the IRS uh, who are going to come after it. Or may, Mary may be in a job where there's very high liability. Um, nurses always come to mind. People who are, or, or people who are working as CNAs, certified nurse assistants, just in kind of not high wage jobs but working with people all the time. So is, there is this real possibility that somebody could get hurt and somebody could sue Mary Jr. In that situation, once again, you may decide that you want to set up a trust for Mary's benefit. Also, Mary just may have some problems managing her funds in general. Mary may have an opioid problem. Mary may have any number of problems. So if you want to set up that trust, kind of trust, you can. The question there is, is, the sibling, is a sibling an appropriate trustee? Or is this just going to cause unbelievable friction among the siblings, in which case, you really need to get some third party. Oftentimes, it can be a niece or a nephew or a friend, some, somebody else. Uh, you, you may want a professional trustee, although they, although they tend to be expensive. And once again, in Mary's case, the question is, the questions are first, when can a final distribution be made? In other words, if the, if the trustee has the discretion to make a distribution to Mary at any time, you may say, that you, that you leave that discretion in the, in the hands of one of her siblings, say, so that if he, she is able to resolve her creditor problems or her other problems, at that point the trustee, the sibling, can simply give her the money. Uh, if that ends up not being the case, then, then as in the case with Paul, the question is where does the money go ultimately? Remember, this trust money may end up getting distributed a long time from now if Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr. are still young. So you want to be kind of figuring that stuff out so you can kind of keep those things in mind. Then, of course, there are the grandchildren. A lot of times people come in and say, well, I just want to leave my, my uh, grandchildren money because they're really going to need it for college. That's the reason why many people will set up these so-called 529 plans, plans which one, if you've put money into the plan account, the interest on that money does not end up um, um, being taxable to you so that the funds end up growing faster. And then the mo money ultimately needs to be used to pay for high school or college. The question though that you want to ask yourself in these situations is what is the real effect 
on that grandchild's ability to get student aid. Uh, as I often tell people, when, when you're setting up one of these plans, thinking that you're giving the money to the grandchildren, you really may, be wanting, you may, really may end up giving it to Harvard. Now that sounds like, I don't, I don't have any problems with your giving money to Harvard, um, but the, the, the question is, how is Harvard going to look at those funds, or how is the local state college going to look at those funds? When that uh, grandchild submits the FAFSA application, um, um, it, or, and many colleges other than state schools also rely on FAFSA, although, although they may evaluate the information in a different way. But, but it, is my, it has been my experience that typically uh, a college or university will look at money that is in trust for a child and will say, well, that money is available for the child and therefore that child does not need as much student aid. And typically, uh, if the money is available to that, specifies that child, they're simply going to subtract the amount that is available to the child from the amount of the student aid, dollar for dollar. Uh, on the other hand, um, if, the, if the money is given to simply the parent, uh, it, and the parent is not a trustee for the benefit of the child, but the money is simply given to the parent, then t it typically um, the evaluation of the parent's assets assigns a total, a, a percentage of the value of those assets to that child, and the school will say, well, that's the percentage of the assets that are available for that child. And typically, once that child reaches the age of majority, or certainly the age of 21, um, that calculation in terms of the assets coming from the parent kind of goes away, unless the assets are there in trust for the benefit of the child, in which the case the school would say legitimately, those assets are still available. So, those are issues that you really want to consider. Um, also, in, in, if, you're, if you're structuring things, um, it, because we talked earlier about well, what happens if one of my children has predeceased me and money is being held for the benefit of that child, you want to be figuring out who's the best trustee that can, and, and could it be one of the other children? When, the, when is the final age of distribution? There are a number of those issues. Now, once Mary has figured that out in terms of what her plan needs to be, the question is what's the best vehicle for implementing the plan? Certainly, Mary can simply do a will and specify all of those things through a will. Or she can own assets um, jointly with a child, or she could name somebody with a POD, a pay on death provision. Or she could create a revocable and amendable trust. Um, the easiest way for Mary to, get, to make sure that all the assets get distributed uh, is to have somebody that she trusts, perhaps Peter, uh, if she really trusts him, to, and to say to Peter, before I die, what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to just distribute these assets. Um, if, especially if I'm, you know, if I'm really sick, you know I'm not going to need the assets anymore. Just distribute them. And by the way, the interesting thing about this mechanism is that if you distribute them, there is no gift tax. Uh, there's a myth that there's a gift tax. There isn't, unless your total assets are worth more than, unless your total gifts are, are more, more than $11 million. And by doing these early gifts, you can avoid paying the state tax. We're going to talk about that in a few minutes. Um, Peter can have immediate access to these funds and can make these distributions. The distributions can avoid the estate tax as long as they're made prior to death. Um, the danger, of course, with this is that, A, Peter can do what he wants with this money if he's got this kind of control over it. So you're trusting that Peter's going to do the right thing. And B, if Peter has control of the money, then, then you're faced with those divorce issues. That if there's a, div a divorce happening, you know, the, 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 the daughter-in-law you never liked can get a handle on that. Um, if there is, so the second way is to simply hold, for Mary to hold her assets till she dies and then divide it according to the terms of a will. And that works fine. Um, it, it, and it's usually a, 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 a not an expensive option as opposed to creating trusts and things. The issue is that after Mary dies, the, 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 using the will mechanism doesn't, doesn't save Mary any money, um, um, but it, it, or does save Mary money because the cost of it is very low, but, it, but after she dies, her kids are going to need to face this, dealing with the probate process. Probate is designed to make sure that assets that you own at the moment of your death get distributed to the right people. But it's also designed to make sure that creditors get paid. Creditors have one year from the day of your death to file a claim against the probate estate, 
which is the reason why probate always takes at least a year and a day. To the extent that you want to avoid that hassle for your kids, to the extent that you want to avoid the legal fees involved in filing for probate and going through that process, and that, those legal fees typically are around be somewhere between three and $10,000, depending on how complicated things get, and to the extent that you want to make sure that the kids aren't arguing, because the probate process gives the kids a forum in which to argue, because there are several things that happen in probate which, unless everybody assents to them, require a court hearing. So they're a bad place to go if you have a, a relatively dysfunctional family. If those are the issues, then you probably want to, to avoid that by having Mary create a revocable and amendable trust. Revocable means whatever you put into the trust, you can always take it back out. So if Mary wants to change things at any time, she can. Amendable means once they're in trust, um, Mary can change the rules of the trust at any time until she dies. So Mary's in control while she is alive. She would name a successor trustee though, probably one of the kids, um, to take charge at the moment of her death so that these assets would not go through probate. There can be literally immediate distributions. Um, the, the new trustee could turn around and distribute all these assets literally the next day and there's much, much less likelihood for arguments. Finally, a couple words about a couple specifics. The cottage. Mary has a cottage in this case and the question is how to keep the good times rolling because all the kids have really enjoyed the cottage, that you know they want the grandchildren to keep going there and that's terrific. You, what you also want to make sure though is if you're preserving the cottage you avoid the fights that often come with the cottage. There are two ways to handle this. One, you can actually try to figure it out and you can talk to the kids prior to your death and you can kind of figure out the set of rules. Who gets what week? Who figures out the budget? Who collects the budget? What happens if somebody doesn't pay? What happens if everybody decides at the end to sell the property? How do you, how do you agree whether you're going to sell the property? What's the new price going to be? There are a bunch of those issues. The second option, which I typically advise the clients is, avoid this headache. You don't need it. The nuclear option, put into your will that the cottage gets sold within some specified period, like six months, unless everybody has agreed otherwise. And then they can figure all of this out. And if you want, do want to put in a provision that says if the cottage is sold, that, that, that one of them gets the right to buy the cottage or gets a priority, my suggestions are use the assessed value of the property so they're not fighting about that. Um, perhaps if, the, if one of them doesn't end up buying, put a right of first refusal in so that if it goes on the market for, and it ends up, there's an offer for much less than what they, they had talked about, the kids can still step in to buy and decide whether the kids have the right to get this, that property financed um, by, the, by the other siblings. Finally, avoiding the estate tax. This is very simple. The estate, ta the taxable estate, Mary's taxable estate in this case is $1.3 million. The Massachusetts estate tax is 50, on that estate would be $55,400. There are a couple of ways that you can deal with that, right? But the easiest way is to simply give assets away before Mary dies. Uh, and, I, and I'm going to do a more detailed presentation on gifting later in the year. But it, once again, contrary to public myth, to, to very common myth, there would not be a gift tax in that case. So there's not going to be a penalty to Mary for giving away things before she dies. So I hope you enjoyed this presentation. Remember the goal of life is to sleep well at night. If you're not worried about this, don't worry about it. If you are worried about it though, you may want to talk to a lawyer about it. Um, you can always find this presentation again on YouTube um, at, at, our, at our YouTube channel, Elder Law Frank and Mary, uh, or you can contact me directly. Uh, there's, my phone number is 508-860-1470. My email, uh, abergeron, A-B-E-R-G-E-R-O-N at myrickoconnell.com. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed the presentation.